So how do how do you conduct machine learning experiments? And how do you evaluate the results of those learning experiments? Now, uh, the weird thing is that, uh, you know, this year, uh, the course uh, is taught at the same time as our introductory seminar uh, in accounting and information systems. So I have two groups of students here. I have AAS students, they have everybody else. So AAS students, I already had the misfortune of listening to me earlier this week where I talked about two papers in machine learning, actually two pretty good papers in machine learning, which were both experimental papers, basically. Well, one of them also had some theoretical development, but then a big chunk of it was experimental paper. And they dealt with this exact issue of conducting experiments and evaluating experimental results. And they did it differently. That was also something that made it very interesting because, uh, and they were published in good, in good journals. Uh, they, they, they did it differently. So in a way it was strange because uh, you see, logically this chapter has to come first. So it would be good to cover this chapter first and then to cover those papers. So I didn't have that option. Well, some of you actually heard those papers a year earlier, right? Uh, but now we're going to do this in a more or less uh, methodical, systematic way. So, uh, what's the question? Well, the question is how to compare different machine learning algorithms. Okay? Now, as this chapter mentions, it is impossible to create a universally best machine learning algorithm. And people kind of intuitively understood it for a very, very long time. About 20 years ago, some guys decided actually to put it on paper, so there were a few papers published. Uh, so it became known in machine learning as no free lunch theory. So basically, if you create a machine learning algorithm, which seems to work extremely well in certain applications, it means that the uh, inductive bias if you wish, of that algorithm is fine-tuned to that application domain. And it also means that you can construct actually different domains to make this algorithm fail. Okay, so this is what the trick is all about. So if the algorithm works well somewhere, you can actually make it fail. Okay. So therefore, uh, it is absolutely hopeless to say, okay, so we're going to have will find this holy grail, right? this algorithm which is going to beat everything else. It is not going to happen. So that's not the right question to ask. Right? So what's the right question to ask? Well, the right question to ask is which algorithms work best in a particular application? Okay? And different algorithms will be performed very differently because uh, the whole beauty of machine learning is the variety of algorithms and all those different biases that those algorithms introduce, right? So the challenge is to find which of those algorithms is suitable to what you want to do, okay? And then to actually prove it. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, we want to compare the performance on certain data. Now, this data can be synthetic or it can come from real life. Usually, uh, you know, our preference, overriding preference, is to use real-life data. Uh, we do resort to simulations. We do resort to synthetic data when, for whatever reason, we cannot get the kind of data that we want in real life. But then keep in mind that in simulation, very often, you will get what you put in. Right? It depends really on how you simulate. So you, it is very, really, it's very easy to rig the game. So the challenge when you write a simulation paper to show is that you didn't read the game, that you set up a simulation in such a way that it still makes sense, that it's not going to be set up to show what you set up to show. Okay, uh, and uh, how do we do that? Well, we already talked about this. So we do this usually by uh, training our algorithms on some data, 
and evaluating our algorithms on the data which was not used for training. Now, this is very important because uh, what these algorithms are for are the applications in real life. And the real life is not a textbook, you cannot look up the answer. When you are training your algorithm and then evaluating them on the training, this is basically as the same as trying to fit the answers you read at the end of your textbook. And you cannot do it in real life. Right? So therefore, our challenge is to set up our experiments uh, so that uh, they resemble what is going to happen in real life applications. Now, if we have very, very large data sets, then there is really no problem because we can take parts of those data sets, train on them, take some other parts, evaluate the results on those parts, they take yet more parts for training and evaluate them again. Why do we have to repeat the evaluation processes? Well, because uh, different parts of the data. So we, you, typically we're dealing with populations which may be infinitely large. And depending what kind of samples we get from that population, the results will differ. So there will be this idiosyncratic variability of results simply due to the composition of the sample. And we want to get rid of this, that variability, right? Because it really interferes with us knowing what is going on. So what I'm trying to say is that when we evaluate the performance of the algorithms, the results of our evaluation are necessarily stochastic. So they are not deterministic numbers, they are random numbers. Now those, and if we set up our evaluation in a reasonable way, then usually it is easy to show, usually very, very easy for to show that uh, our metrics will be unbiased metrics, meaning that the uh, expected value of those metrics will indeed be the accuracy, or if you want the accuracy, or whatever parameters of our algorithms. So it is not difficult to design unbiased metrics of performance. What is difficult is to design such unbiased metrics of performance that fluctuate very little. So it is not really about the expected value of our metrics. It is really about the variance. So the, we want our metrics of performance, which are random numbers, and they depend on the samples that we work with, to fluctuate as little as possible. Why? Because this, really is, this is what gives us the actual boundaries on the performance. There will be some basic statistical stuff at the end of this chapter. And uh, we'll refresh your memory, but I mean, jumping a little bit ahead, uh, we basically we want to have fairly tight uh, intervals on the performance that we obtain by running these metrics. So this this is why we re we want to repeat our experiments. And then if we have large data sets, it's no problem. We have a lot of options to repeat our experiments. The problem emerges when our data set is of limited size. Okay? If the data set is of limited size, then we can just use something, evaluate it, and move on to something else. So what, uh, what is the state of the art? In this case, the state of the art is to use the so-called resampling methods. And a lot of stuff in this chapter is about these resampling methods. Right, where we reuse the observations in our data set over and over and over again to obtain different measurements of the same thing, of the same type of performance, so that hopefully then, later on, we can average those estimates with the idea that, as with any averaging, it will reduce the variance of our estimates. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so what are the measures? So, what are we interested in? Well, the uh, metric, which is and the, 
used, utilized most commonly, and that's the one which is used in this chapter, is a misclassification error. Or uh, the complementary thing to it is prediction accuracy, okay, which is basically one minus. It's the, it's the same thing. Now, uh, the chapter also mentions that, of course, uh, there are cases where you have to consider the so-called risk or loss function. Now, uh, this is something which is particularly important in applications that you will encounter most often. Because in our applications that we are interested in, uh, the loss function is typically asymmetric. We'll talk about that later on. So I already talked a lot about this uh, on Tuesday, for those of you who, to, who take that class. So, but unfortunately, this chapter doesn't really deal with this issue. And from this general machine learning, machine learning point of view, this is more of an emerging issue. So there are many applications in machine learning where just misclassification error or prediction accuracy are perfectly fine. In many business applications, particularly in accounting applications, we cannot just rely on that measure simply because uh, the cost matters for us. So the differential cost between false positives and false negatives that we talk later about is so drastically different. Usually orders of magnitude different. Okay. Uh, but uh, and, and again, but this is what we're going to be dealing here. Now then keep in mind that there are other measures. Of course, this misclassification error or prediction accuracy is the most important one. This is what machine learning is about, making accurate predictions. Right? But there are other things say complexity measures. Uh, how long does it take, or how much resources does it take, uh, say, to train our classifier? Uh, and then how much time and how much resources does it take to utilize this classifier for prediction? This is what they say, that this is complexity of training and complexity of testing. Right? The time complexity has to do with computational time, and the space complexity has to do with the amount of memory which is needed. Right? And you will already encounter the cases where, say, some of these measures become more important. You remember that we talked about the fact that in lazy learners, the space complexity, the memory, becomes extremely important because, say, in the nearest neighbor, you have to keep the whole data set. And you have to utilize that whole data set when you are testing, when you're making predictions. So. Uh, in some other cases, this is not that important. So again, so this is application dependent. In some cases, it can be a deal breaker. Now, keep in mind that there may be cases where you may have a perfectly great algorithm that you will not be able to use simply because, say, it requires so much computation, then the results are useless. Right? So that you have to make a prediction by the time you need that prediction. Right? Or well, otherwise, we will be, you know, there was that uh, old joke about weather forecasters. When a guy calls this weather forecasting station and asks them, okay, can you tell me what kind of the weather we're going to get tomorrow? And they say, we'll be glad to oblige, but please call us the day after. <laughs> uh, well, by the way, it was at the time weather forecasting. These days, we actually we can tell we're going to get tomorrow. Usually. We're still not so good with the tornadoes, <laughs> with those really bad things. OK, uh, interpretability, what's that? Well, this is what we call knowledge extraction. Uh, with some of those, we actually can interpret the results. You remember we talked about decision trees, production rules, if-then rules. So those are great. Uh, linear regression is great, right? Because you look at the coefficients, the size and the magnitude. So it really is easily interpretable. Uh, we'll see more stuff later on in this class where it's not easy. In some cases, it's not. Uh, you'll see that in many cases, particularly when you use things like neural networks, well, I mean, there's an architecture it does something. In some cases, by design, it may be designed to capture something, but it is very, very difficult to interpret. So if this is important, we have this limits the universe of methods that we can use. Uh, you know, in some cases, it becomes critically important uh, when you have to justify your decisions. 
So there are areas of activity where you cannot just say that I did it because the computer told me to do it, right? So there may be legal implications, implications, there will be say situations say in the medical domain where you actually you, you have to argue, right? You may be taken to court to defend what you have done. And if you cannot convince the other humans that what you have done is reasonable, it may be a problem. So you may have a great neural network, but you can't say, well, if you know I decided to amputate that limb because the neural network told me, right, <laughs> that I have to. Well, I mean, I'm exaggerating, I don't, it's all recorded. <laughs> yes? Is it an indirect relationship with um, overfitting, say, you overfit the data, maybe it's... No, overfitting is a different method. So overfitting, this is what we're trying to avoid here. That's, that was the, exactly the reason why I said that we're going to use this. So what is overfitting? Overfitting is the phenomenon when we do the fit. You see, when we use the training. It becomes more complex, right, when we overfit something. Well, it becomes unnecessarily complex. That's, yeah, that's one of the reasons. But, but the manifestation, I said that. But you know, the fit is usually not even a metric for us. It's just an intermediary consideration. It's not that this is the difference between many studies that, for example, you see in some other areas where people try, we try to understand the universe. Let's see what fits and let's interpret the fitted function, right? So this is not our objective. Our objective is to predict what's going to happen. So that's why, you know, that's how we avoid overfitting. So overfitting really here should become a non-issue because when we, if we evaluate performance properly, means that we do it on the testing, and this is prediction accuracy, overfitting has to be taken, will be taken care of because if it overfits, it will okay. fail. And indirectly, doesn't it kind of make it harder to interpret things if you want to? Assume? That's a different method. So what you are saying, so what I'm saying is that if we do the evaluation properly, that overfitting will be revealed and discarded. But there are other issues. For example, it may happen when we end up with ties. You see, we evaluate, for example, there will be a lot of discussion about comparing different machine learning algorithms. So we compare several different algorithms. And it is possible we end up in a tie. Basically, in a, in a situation where the results are indistinguishable, statistically. You look at it, it's more or less the same. Then what you are saying will apply. Then we always fall back on, you remember we called it Occam's razor, right? That a simpler explanation is always preferable, keeping everything else constant, right? So, of course, we go for the best predictive performance, but if several different things give us roughly the same predictive performance, we usually go for the simple one, for the simple one. And that one is usually more interpretive. Okay, so the, we always, this simplicity bias is always in the back of our head, right? So that we always assume that simpler is always better. We don't want to complicate things unnecessarily. So that's things are better predictors, but they're very hard to interpret that. Well, and that's what, but if they indeed better predictors, if they give significantly better performance, depending on the application, you either go with them or not. Now, if you are in there, as I said, so you absolutely need interpretability. So that particular neural network may be great, but you know that you may get into trouble. So you may have to put it aside simply because of that. That's what I said. That you, you need this knowledge extraction, and maybe not just to understand what is going on, but to defend yourself, to argue, to say, OK, that's why I do it. So very often you need those justifications, right? Explanation, right? So in the old days, I don't know if you, some of you probably already uh, looked up some, some stuff about expert systems. You know that we use those if-then rules and you use this chain reasoning, right? So already in the late 70s, people realized that actually, you know, we have, we have to provide this explanatory capability, which basically me meant tracing the chaining of the rules. And uh, for a human, this is just the chain of reasoning, right? 
because of this I, I have that, because of that I have that, and because of that I get here. And that's why I did this. So that works, right? When you have a bunch of humans, say a jury, sitting there and you have to convince them, okay, what I did makes sense, then such kind of an argument usually works, right? So, but if you show them in your network and say, well, I mean, I trained it, it adjusted the weights, then I calculated, right? They told me to cut it, and, and then I mean, it's not really my fault, right? Okay. Uh, easy programmability. Well, I would say that these days this is a secondary consideration. For some of you, it may be the primary one if uh, you end up with something which is uh, too difficult to implement. You may say, just uh, to help with it. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's one of those. And then finally, what I said that here with this cost sensitive learning, here, yeah, we actually, for us, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. So we really have to make sure that we are actually evaluating the results properly. So and that it's not always just the accuracy. OK, so how do we evaluate? So we have to set up an experiment. Okay? And there is this whole science how to do this. right? Uh, so here we look just this uh, special case, see how it applies to our area of machine learning. So, and the rough schematic is shown here. So we have the input. This is going to be our data. And uh, we can use it in a number of different ways. So how we feed the input is up to us. We have certain controllable factors. Like what? Well, the primary one very often would be the learning target that we decide to use, right? So are we going to use I don't know, a linear discriminant function? Are we going to use uh, nearest neighbors? Are we going to use decision, decision trees? Or any of the stuff that we are going to consider later, uh, like neural networks to support vector machines, right? So that's one of the problems. Another very important controllable factor are those parameters that we have in the learners. So we already talked about some of them before, right? And we'll talk more about this later. So more, many learning algorithms are parameterized. And depending on the setting of those parameters, we will, may get drastically different results. Mm -hmm. Performance may differ very significantly depending on the settings of those parameters. So I don't know if you have already started playing with Wecker, which is highly advisable. Right? You will have to use it. Well, you don't have to. I give you some other options, but more, this is what most people end up doing. Uh, so you'll have to use it for your computational project. And you see, when you select learners, those uh, learning functions in Weka, uh, there will be a lot of parameters. And uh, very often you will, well, I mean, what am I supposed to do with that? Right? Uh, how am I going to set that? So those are uh, controllable factors. And we want to manipulate them in such a way so that we can achieve the best possible result. No. Unfortunately, we have all these intervening things, those uncontrollable factors, which spoil it for us, which makes the results variable, right? And this is what we want to reduce. So one of the objectives of this experiment is to reduce as much as possible the variability uh, introduced by uncontrollable factors while still finding the best possible combination of controllable factors that allows us to achieve the best possible result. Right? Now, this is just a basic schema to keep in your mind as you move, move ahead with this. Okay? So, how do we, what do we do with those controllable factors? Well, uh, there are ad hoc approaches, like this one, meaning what? What is the best guess? Well, some people can say, well, uh, I have some intuition about how this thing works, right? So I think I can make a very good guess about what the parameters are supposed to be. So you make that guess, you evaluate the results, 
and then you start this wandering about, right? Not exactly a random walk. It's more or less like this wandering about, just trying to search maybe in the neighborhood to see what if I change this parameter a little bit, go this, this one goes up, right? That one goes down. Uh, see how it changes and then stops somewhere. Now, uh, this is highly irregular. Okay, this is highly irregular. And uh, usually, uh, you're not going to get the really good results with this because very often our intu intuition uh, will deceive us. And I don't think you will be able to, con to convince anybody. So that's another thing. You know, when you write a research paper, you actually have to convince people uh, that you have found some really good stuff here. So therefore, people usually don't rely on this. So what do they use? Well, the other two I use, both of them. So there is this one fact at a time, and this thing that people call complete factorial design. So one fact at a time says, well, you know, uh, what if we examine how a single factor affects the results if we keep all the other factors fixed? Okay, so this is what it does. So it says, okay, we have this kind of, uh, number of different factors. Let us fix them, say, at their middle values, all them, and then keep all the factors fixed at that value, except for one. And let's change it systematically across the range of their values and measure the results of the performance. And let's look at these measurements and keep the one which we think is the best. So we'll save it for the future. Okay? And then let's reset. Let's reset this factor to its, let's say, mean value. And keep this one and the other ones fixed, and let's change the other one. So you, you pick all the factors one by one, and each one of them is systematically examined in this way to determine the best value of this factor, while all the other factors are fixed, say, at the medium point or whatever, something, which you consider to be the default value. And then you will go with the settings of the factors that you determined. So each factor will get the best setting that you determined for that factor while you kept all the other factors fixed. So uh, what's the problem with this approach? Obviously, this approach assumes what? It takes one time to do it. The, as a matter of fact, no. This is considered to be relatively fast compared to the alternative. Assumes the independence. Assumes the independence of the effect of the factors. So it assumes that, you know, the way that how this factor influences the outcome doesn't really depend on what the values of the other factors are. Okay. If that were indeed the case, that would be great. That's, that's life, right? So uh, why, would, why it would be the case? Well, uh, imagine that you have k factors, and each factor has L levels. Okay? K factors and L levels. Right? So how many computations do we have to do? How many determinations? So what is expensive here? What is expensive here is to do evaluation for each setting. So evaluation is expensive because we have to train and then we have to evaluate. So that's the unit. That's the expensive unit. So how many evaluations do we have to do here? Well, we have to do here K times L. Because for every K, we have to evaluate all the possible L things, right? Is it a lot? Well, not really. Compared to what? Well, compared to the complete factorial design. So what is the complete factorial design? Complete factorial design means that you systematically examine all the possible combinations of all the factors. And for every combination of the factors, you determine the outcome. 
And after you determine the outcome for every combination of the factors, you pick the best one. And that combination of the factors is the best. So in the setting that I told you, so you have k factors and l levels. How many evaluations do we have to do? Hmm? What to the power of what? K to l. Is it? So for one factor, we have l combinations. So how many combinations we have? So for one factor is L, for another factor is L, for the third factor is K. L to the power of K. L to the power of K, right? Because it is L times L times L times L K times. L to the power of K. Now that's a lot, right? So when, for modest numbers, just, just imagine. Uh, Let's say that you have 10 factors and 10 levels, right? K times L is 100, right? L to the power of K is 10 billion, right? So it's not doable, right? You realize. I mean, 10 factors, 10 levels. So this one factor at a time is 100 evaluations. A complete factorial design is 10 billion evaluations. So uh, therefore, people actually cannot do this. Uh, so what do they do? Well, they try to approximate it. So think about it. So what are we trying to create? We're trying to create what we call this response surface, right? Response surface. What is this response surface? So this is the value of the output, the measure of goodness, whatever that measure is, depending on the values of the factors, right? So people say, well, what does usually happen? Well, we think that it really behaves like a quadratic function, right? That for certain uh, values of the factors, first we keep changing, it keeps improving, right? Then it gets to a peak, right? Then it starts dropping off. Right? This is in the universe. Right? In the multivariate case, you can visualize this as a kind of a quadratic surface. So what can you do? Well, you can run basically like a regression function. You, instead of getting all those points, you try to get sufficiently many of them and then see if you can fit a quadratic surface to those points to get this response surface. And if you manage to do that, then that response surface is easy to optimize and to find which combinations of the points should give you a maximum. Okay, as a matter of fact, it can become a basis for a good iterative procedure. So you start doing this, calculate, say, you get some approximation of this. this do not the same what I'm talking about. Right? So because you get a couple of measurements here, right? They give you the outcome. You say, why don't you try to approximate what they get using this quadratic surface? You run like this, basically, linear regression with those quadratic terms. Calculate the results. Calculate what the maximum is. You get the value of the parameters, typically something that you haven't used before. Run your evaluation for that value of the parameters. See what you get. Add it to the points that you have rerun your surface approximation, it will be slightly different, right? Recalculate again the optimum and proceed and see where, where, where it takes you. So it's actually not a bad thing. So the, there are these various iterative methods, right? For example, here you can try wandering around. So for example, when you do this one at a time, you found that base value, so fix it at that value. And then evaluate the other one when that value is fixed at that, and then keep fixing. Now the problem with that that obviously you know all these are local search procedures. So depending on which order you do this, it will send you in different directions. Right? So you can keep adding. So depending on how much time you have to play with this, 
And you know, in some cases, it's an offline problem. So when we do this evaluation, we are not under time pressure. In some cases, there are, there are applications where we have to evaluate it right away but, uh, and learn very fast. But in some cases, the learning part can be done offline. And that means that we can actually afford a lot of calculations, as long as it is not mind-boggling, as long as it doesn't completely exceed the computational constraints of the term. OK, so these are the basic strategies of experimentation. How are we doing so? Yeah. What can, we can use one factor at a time. What can we do that? Or can we implement that? Well, yes, that's easy to implement. But the problem is that it is misleading. Because you will get the result that may be very far from the optimal. Because you assume that they're independent. As a matter of fact, in the vast majority of cases, we know that the assumption is wrong. We have very good reasons to believe that it is just the opposite. As a matter of fact, they are dependent. And there are significant dependencies. Okay? So that's why I said this. So you can try to do this to make it more of this a little bit guided local search. You can try to do this more extensive thing, but not completely, because I mean, with 10 by 10, you already get a ridiculous result, right? Uh, so then just do those response surfaces. So but there are different variants that people utilize, depending on the circumstances. Yeah, what is L? The number of different values a particular variable can take. Yes. If a factor is uh, continuous, yes. you, you can discretize. Well, you can discretize okay. because you can say okay. you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is the uh, are we just assuming the response surface is like the <coughs> shape of a quadratic? Right. Surface. Well, because this is typically you know when we're trying to optimize something, so we assume that this. It, and by the way, this may not be a good assumption. In some cases, for, for example, <coughs> you know the quadratic function is a unimodal function, right? If you have reasons to believe, then depending on the factors that it can be a multimodal function, right? Then obviously quadratic approximation is not a good one. But the good thing is that it is fairly simple, right? So there are not that many terms, so it's much easier to approximate. Again, those are heuristic procedures. If you want exhaustive, in some cases, <coughs> depending on what you're doing with it, it may be possible, based on certain assumptions, to try to derive analytically what the best result is. But usually it is very, very difficult. But uh, the importance of tuning the parameters, or say choosing the right factors, cannot be. Uh, overestimated. It is, a, it is a really, really important thing. <coughs> Other questions? This is just for two factors? or These are two factors, yeah. I mean, yeah. What? What you have? Usually you have more, right? This, what, what I said, I said if, you, if you have 10 factors with 10 levels each, you have 10 to the power yeah. of 10, which is 10 billion, yeah. right? Uh, right. No, that, that's exactly the point. That's, that's what I'm saying. But yeah. Actually, yeah, this looks good, right? As long as it's two by two, right? And then uh, <coughs> if you have more factors, uh, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, there is actually this very good list. Uh, will you? Uh, do your computational studies or when you write your papers about machine learning, it is always useful for you just to okay, keep it in the back of your mind. So go back, pull this up, and just compare what you are doing to this. It really helps, you know, it helps to be methodical, to proceed in this disciplined fashion, you know, step by step. I, by the way, I realize that this is not how typically research works, right? So most human beings are not very disciplined, right? So we keep wandering and jumping from one thing to another. But it does help to impose this discipline from time to time. It really disciplines your mind, OK? So OK, what are we supposed to do? So the aim of the study, right? OK, so we have to be very clear about that. 
So for example, I want to compare several competing algorithms. I think that these algorithms are good for this domain. So that's my purpose, my objective. So selection of the response variable. Okay, what is it? Is it just the accuracy? Do we have to be uh, concerned with the asymmetric cost function? Do computational resources matter? Right? So what are we talking about? Uh, in different papers, use <coughs> very different ones. <coughs> those of you, <coughs> sorry, those of you who took my <coughs> electronic commerce course a year ago, there were a number of papers which were related to this domain where people use something similar. You see that in different papers, people use different metrics. So there are different uh, output variables. So choice of factors and levels. Okay? Choice of experimental design. Again, we'll talk about that. Then actually running the experiment, statistical analysis, don't forget about that. So you have to make sure that uh, your results are uh, as justifiable as possible. And finally, formulate conclusions and recommendations. So that's just again a useful checklist. Keep that in mind. Okay, <clears throat> so as I said, in the age of big data, okay, so we have this luxury of riches. If you have a lot of data, you don't have to worry about a lot of things, right? So basically, you can have multiple training sets, multiple testing sets. So this is an inexhaustible reservoir, and you can just keep doing this. Unless, of course, you decide to run your model on the whole data set. Now, uh, this may be problematic. You know, uh, machine learning emerged in the area when data was scarce, okay? when it was difficult to come up with a lot of data. So therefore, uh, the methods had similar limitations to what people did in conventional statistics. You know, when people work with uh, data sets, classical statistics, utilize data sets of several hundred, maybe several thousand of observations, right? People process those things by hand, or maybe using just basic calculators. Nobody actually at that time worked with the data sets of millions of observations. Now, these days, you have data sets, for real, with billions of observations, right? Depending on what it is, so there are data sets like that. Now, in a way, it changes the ball game. Uh, because uh, in the past, uh, if people had the data, they used the data, right? Nobody would actually leave some data untouched. Now here, if you have to run the models, which grow, say, computational complexity, it's really not a very expensive model. Say, computational complexity grows as a quadratic function of the input. Okay? By conventional measures, it's actually it's a low computational complexity problem. Now, with the data sets containing billions of observations, even today, with all our computer prowess, you can pretty much forget about running a quadratic complexity model on a data set with a billion observations, right? Why? Because 10 to the power of 9 taken to the degree of 2 is 10 to the power of 18, right? So 10 to, to the power of 18 sounds really, really impressive. Just calculate how much it's going to take you to get any results. So this tells you that a lot of conventional methods cannot be run on the whole data set. So you do have to use parts of it. So therefore, what is proposed in this top point makes a lot of sense. So you use multiple parts of the data set and just repeat your experiment. And those repetitions, in this case, will actually be, so if you partition the data set in some kind of a random fashion, right, you can make a safe assumption that your experiments are independent. Right? So you have 
you ran, you repeated that experiment, I don't know, 100 times. Oh, that's terrific. I mean, you average the results. I mean, the law of large numbers already kicks in, right? You look at the residuals, well, you, wonderful, you kill the variance, you have very good estimates of what you want, you're home free, right? So if you have this unlimited supply of data, so if you have limited supply of data, you cannot afford this anymore, right? So you have to reuse your data. How do you reuse your data? There are a number of different resampling techniques that have been proposed over the years. By far, the most popular one is known as K-fold cross-validation. Okay? K-fold cross-validation. So this is the technique which was used in one of the papers that I covered in Tuesday. So what is the basic idea of k-fold cross-validation? The idea is to take a data set and randomly partition it into k equal parts, OK? If we are dealing with a classification problem, it is standard practice to utilize the so-called stratified partitioning. Uh, what is it? This is the partitioning that takes classes into account. So uh, basically, if we ignore the output of the observations, if we just uh, partition the observations themselves without taking into account the class membership, then the proportion of classes will not necessarily be exact. The proportion of classes in the folds will not necessarily be the same as the proportion of classes in the whole data set because of random fluctuation. It should be close if you have sufficiently large number of observations for all the classes, okay? But it will not necessarily be the same. Now, if the certain classes have very few observations, the problem becomes severe. You can end up with data sets, with uh, folds, where some classes are either drastically underrepresented or they're drastically overrepresented or whatever. So, and that's not good because we want each fold to be representative of the data set as a whole. So for that reason, we do stratified partitioning. So you can think of it simply as doing partitioning separately for each class. So this is the best way to think about it. So you want to partition a data set, say, into k parts. And the data set has three different classes. So take each one of those classes separately, and partition that class into 10 equal parts. And give a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 10. Right? And then combine one with one with one, OK? The first fold of all the classes taken together is one fold. The second fold for all the classes taken together is the second fold, and so on, until you end up with all k, in this case, 10 folds, right? If you remember your course in basic statistics, then this is pretty much what the so-called stratified sampling does, right? So no big deal, you know, have used this trick for a long time. So uh, what this guarantees is this stable proportion of classes in each fold. Right? So each fold will have exactly the same proportion of all the classes as the data set itself. Right? So this is how people do this. Uh, by the way, as you increase the number of folds, it may become more and more difficult to do. Because uh, for some of the classes, you may run out, uh, run out of the observations. So obviously, if you have a class with very few observations, you cannot have the number of folds exceeding that number, right? But even if you have half of it, you see then uh, already there will be problems. That, uh, so no, you, you can still, because you can split mostly into two, but there will be the last one, which actually contains one. So again, there will be issues with rounding. You really don't want to have folds where a class has really few observations. You would prefer to keep the number of classes in each fold, the number of observations for each class in the fold reasonable. Uh, 
okay, if possible. Now, there is another reason why people often don't want uh, the more than the, uh, the larger the number of folds, the smaller the size of an individual fold. And in K folding, every learner will be evaluated on a single fold. So when you evaluate a learner on the testing part, which is very small, this increases the variability of the result. Right? Because think of the result. For every observation, say, let's say that you are con concerned only about accuracy. Okay, let's say for the sake. Well, suppose you are concerned only about accuracy. When you do your evaluation, you have an observation point in the test itself. You do the evaluation, check the class. Accurate or no accurate? Okay? So if you repeat it very many times and you average it, it's like estimating the probability as a frequency. The larger the sample, the more accurate of your estimate of the probability it is. So that the variance will decrease. So when you do this estimation on a very small sample, it necessarily will be quite variable. So you don't really want the, this fold to get too small. So, so what do you do with this k-fold? So you have these k, uh, k parts, and you do the following. You take one of them out, all the other k minus 1 are kept together, and you train on them. After you train the learner on those k minus 1, you test this learner on the remaining k-part. K part. Then you put it back in. Remove another one. So you have another combination of k minus 1. And now another fold to test on. And you repeat. You train on k minus 1, and you test on that fold. Right? And this gives you different results. And then you average the results to get the defaults. Now, keep in mind that uh, the training parts are not independent. If you take two different training parts of this k-folding, and, and here k, uh, it, it is repeated k times, because you have k different folds that you can take out. k different folds to take out, so you repeat it k times. And in each one, if you take any two of them, they will have k minus 2 folds in common. You understand that? So you, you have one. So there is one of them. One of the k is missing. There is another one. There is also one of those k is missing. If you take those two out, the other k minus 2 are exactly the same. So no matter which of those k minus 1 folds you take, yes, you, they will have k minus 2 folds in common. Uh, for the PCA uh, methodology, the ro rotation is similar to uh, k fold cross rotation? No. Uh -uh. Because it's, uh, not at all. No. Not at all. Because uh, in principal component analysis, you create new variables. Now here, you're fooling around with the different combinations of the observations. You're working in a space of it really has nothing to do with it. OK? So strictly speaking, okay, uh, the results are not independent. Right? Uh, therefore, I mean, when we use conventional estimates, uh, we're going to make a stretch when we say, well, let's pretend that they're independent, and then we can get this. Then we can get this distribution so, of certain statistics. Uh, this is not independent, so we have to be more careful. Uh, in many cases, by the way, it is difficult to get analytically precise results. So in some cases, you'll see that they do it, but they still have to make certain assumptions, which are not realistic, and we know that they're not satisfied. But without those assumptions, you cannot really get anything. Uh, still, this is probably one of the most widely used methods. I want to draw your attention to the two extremes of this k-folding procedure. One is two-folding, which you will see here, a variation of two-folding. So what is two-folding? Two-folding means that you split it in half. Okay? You train on one, 
test on the other. Then you switch. Train on this, test on, on this, right? And you average the results. Will be the same with the whole sample. What? Will the results will be the same with if you test on the whole sample? No. Average? No, no, nothing more. No. No, because uh, no, because when you test on the whole sample, you you overfit because you are testing uh, on the part which you use for training. Oh, I mean, okay, maybe you mean something else. So maybe I, I should have remarked when no matter what k is. For any K folding, all the sample is used for testing for one of the folds because each of the K folds is used as a testing fold in one of the folds. So you split the sample, so every observation in the sample is used in the testing procedure exactly once when you do K folding. Is that what you meant, or you meant something else? No, I, I mean the average of your k, k times fit. The average of your k times fit will be the same, similar or same, almost the same with if you just uh, fit once for the whole thing. I, I'm not sure I understand. Um, fit what? So uh, we are trying to estimate the performance, the future performance on unseen data. Mm -hmm. So what is the objective? Our objective is, is not to fit the sample. Well, we usually fit the sample because we know that it minimizes the empirical error and uh, we know that it should give good uh, performance, but that's our objective is future performance. So what we do, we're, what we're trying to do, we're trying to come up with an estimate of that future performance. So you, you, you estimate on the K, K minus one, one divided by the k portion of sample. I learn from the k minus one over k portion of the sample. Yes. Then I test it on one over k portion of the sample, yes. and I repeat this test in k times. Yeah. And you right? average it. And I average it. And the, the fit will be almost similar if you fit for the whole sample once. I see. Well, I I I, I think I understand what you're trying to say. Okay. Kind of, not exactly. So I think that what Yunsen is trying to say is the following. That look, this is what we do to estimate what the result of our performance will be. But what we are going to use in the future, if say this is our data, so we did this estimation, but what will our learner be? And our learner will be the learner that we will train on the whole sample. I think this is what you're trying to say. So we're going to train our learner for the future on the whole sample. But our prediction of the performance of that learner is based on this k-folding estimation. And what you're trying to say is that, well, the ultimate, the final learner will be trained on all k-folds. Each one of these learners was trained on k minus 1 folds, which is actually close to that, so it shouldn't be that different, right? Mm -hmm. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, it is different enough. And uh, I can tell you that uh, I don't do it these days, but I used to experiment a lot with this kind. And you know, particularly 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, uh, people were really curious about what they were doing. And I can tell you that even, say, uh, by the way, 10 folding is very common. A lot of people do 10 folding. Even after 10 folding, you will still get fairly significant variability in the results. Okay? Yeah, and this is the reason why what you see in the recent papers, and actually we started doing it about 20 years ago, people repeat it. So what do people actually do? People say, well, why don't we repeat this 10 folding, say, 10 times? Meaning what? You generate 10 different random partitions of your sample, right? So you partition it differently, okay? And for each one of those partitions, you run your 10 folding. So you get 10 results of 10 averages, each one is an average of 10 folds. And then you average those. 
You can also think it's, that thing is actually equivalent of averaging those 100 results, right? Yeah. But I can tell you what, what you can look, so you can, uh, and I've seen this empirically, what happens. So this tenfolding itself kills a lot of variability. So when you do tenfolding, you can actually see very significant variability. You can see, say so you compare the accuracy. And you can see a result where, say, on one fold, the accuracy, I don't know, is 70%. And on the other fold, the accuracy is 80%. That is actually, I've seen this happen over and over again, right? So there will be, I don't know, 20, 30% fluctuations of the estimates in some cases, very significant. But the less variability might come from the nine times of the whole sample because it lacks around the whole sample for more like no, but what I'm saying that times. so individual folds are extremely variable. So when you do these ten fold averages, you still get variability. So you are not going to get something which is extremely. But now variability instead of twenty or thirty percent becomes two percent, three percent, five percent. Okay. So if you look how much they fluctuate, so that variability already by a single ten ten fold because reduced greatly, it is still there. After you do this 100%, if you then keep doing the experiment, that you will see that, say, this averaging over 100, basically, it really brings the variability down. So you really, uh, and this is what we are fighting here. We are fighting the variability of our estimates. So we want to make estimates as stable as possible because then the estimate becomes very accurate. Not only the, on the average it will be on target, but we know that the actual number that we get doesn't deviate that much. Right? So, and, the, and this, this is the objective. I don't know if I responded to what you asked. And for, for big data, it's the same thing? Well, for big, for really big data, you really, you, you, you more folds, right? No, you don't need folds at all. Well, I mean, you can call them folds, but it's not resampling. Mm -hmm. For the big data, you don't have to use resampling. It's the same thing. Yeah, you can use just independent samples if you have truly big data. You don't have that problem because there you have the luxury of riches. You know that. Uh, yeah, if if you if you want to work with the samples, if you have to work with the samples, if you use very simple rules, you may work on the whole data set. Then you, if you work on the whole data set, then you have to use again some kind of this scheme just to make sure because you can uh, fit the estimates are not worth it. Okay. So you need uh, independent estimates of performance, okay? So what do we do here? So Thomas Dietrich mm -hmm. proposed this. He actually came up with the statistics and the distributions of, well, again, under unrealistic assumptions, but uh, still uh, for this. So he says, listen, so this two folding, these are the largest folds you can imagine, right? One folding doesn't make sense in real life, right? So these are the largest folds you can imagine. And we do this, so uh, we average those two folds. But then this idea of repeating it, we do it five times. Not 10 times, by five times. Five times we randomly split into two. Uh, we do this to fold it. So the end result is actually it's averaging over 10, right? But you average five results of two folding. As a matter of fact, already two folding is actually pretty decent at killing variability, which may sound really counterintuitive. This is something. This is uh, something that I mentioned during my lecture on Tuesday. You know, averaging over two is not that much of an average, right? When you think that uh, of the law of large numbers and all that, you average. I mean, take an average of twenty or thirty, so that's already something. Uh, when you take an average of two, it actually, you think that you don't really achieve much, right? Now, interestingly enough, you actually achieve some pretty decent results. So it does, just a single two-fold already decreases variability quite uh, significantly. And the question is why? Well, why is uh, people argue that there are good reasons to believe that if so while, what, is, what is the source of the variability? The source of the variability is because of this 
randomness in what goes into training and what goes into testing. And it may be that the combination that you get can be very favorable. So if you train on these selected guys and then train on those, then actually you may achieve some very good results. Maybe better than what you would get on the average. But then intuitively, the other way around should be just the opposite. So if you train on what you tested, then that's probably not very good for predicting what you do in this case. So, and the argument is that when you flip, and this is actually observed empirically, that the estimates that you get for the two folds are usually negatively correlated. And when you take the average of two things that are negatively correlated, that actually kills the variance much better than when you average independent things. Because negative correlation actually kills the variability. It means that if, uh, if one thing is overestimating performance, then the other thing must be underestimating performance. And when we take the average, we get much closer to the actual performance. So there is this hedging. argument, huh? Hedging. It's, it's not hedging. exactly hedging, but uh, yeah, but this, so if, if you know that, you know, if the positively corre positive correlation is off, because positive correlation means that you uh, things and that thing becomes entrenched, right? So, but negative correlation here, in surprising is, uh, with the random, I mean, it can go either way, you don't know, but negative really kills the variance here. So, okay, so this is known as 5 times 2, and uh, by the way, as I said, today, the common practice is to 10 by 10. Uh, people do it a lot. Uh, no, before I go to this here. Another thing that uh, what I want to mention is jackknife. So uh, jackknife is the other extreme. Jackknife is known as leave one out. I don't know if you have heard this expression. So this is, well, what? Jackknife, yeah, like a jackknife. You know what a jackknife is? Oh. <laughs> no, see it. <laughs> okay, look at that. Google it. Uh, that was uh, that. That's that's how it is known under this name. It's, uh, I mean, people use this idea for I don't know, fifty or sixty years. So what is this? It's basically like K fold cross validation, where K equals capital N. Capital N is the number of observations in your sample. Now think about it for a second. So as I said, uh, the smallest K that makes sense is two, right? This two folding. One folding doesn't make any sense because that's the whole thing. And the largest K that makes sense is capital N, which is the number of observations in the sample, right? So uh, this is uh, a well-known procedure. I mean, I mean, historically it was proposed. I mean, people called it jackknife. Uh, leave one out. Because what you do here, you repeat the following. You take an observation, take it out. Train on all the sample but that observation. Test the result on that observation. See if the prediction is correct or incorrect. Okay, put it back in, take another one out, train on that sample. Well, you repeat your training capital N times the size of the sample, right? Uh, and again, each observation is used in testing exactly once, right? And each, tra each two training sets have exactly N, capital N minus two observations in common. So it's uh, pretty much uh, the whole sample, right? Well, well, I mean, in the past, when so the first computers appeared, you have a sample of 70 observations. It's not that much, right? Depending on what your sample is. So I'm not saying that this is the, by the way, keep in mind that with, uh, with this leave one out, stratification is not possible, obviously, right? But you assume that when you just take one observation for reasonable size, that the proportion of classes in training 
doesn't really change that much, so it should not be that bad, right? So I kill the outliers. What? So I kill the outliers in the position. Well, there may be outliers, yes. So I kill the outliers. Well, but you know, with outliers, again, if they were in the sample, as a matter of fact, the effect of outliers should be diminished, because when your outliers end up uh, with the smaller samples, they will affect it more. And when you test on the outlier, well, you test on the outlier anyway, right? So the results on the outlier depends on what your metrics are. Some metrics will be more sensitive to outliers, some, met some metrics will be less sensitive to outliers, right? Again, so those are the extremes, but all this is k fold cross validation extremely popular. Now, another, yes? Jack, is it, uh, does it give us better performance than k fold? No, usually not. And there are comparable estimates. That was one of the historical. By the way, it's not bad. It's a decent performance. Well, that's why I said that these days people don't do it. They do it, I can tell you when they do it. When the data sets are extremely small. So one of the problems, like I, I can tell you that the, one of the problems uh, when you do this, it is very difficult to train on the small data sets, OK? So uh, that's why people may often increase k. You know, the greater your k is, the larger the training set is, right? Because the training set is always n minus k. Right? So, uh, no. What is it? I'm sorry. N minus uh, no. The data, the size of the data set in, is always n uh, n minus n over k. Okay. It is k k minus one divided by k times n. Right. It is n minus n over k. So the greater the k is the greater the training set is, right? Obviously, because you remove n minus n over k part from the training. So if you have very small data sets, and you're concerned just the data set is barely enough just to train on the whole thing, okay? So then it becomes a problem. Then you want to remove as little as possible. So you still use pretty much almost everything for training. So if you have very small data sets, you may want to use Jackknife. Okay, that's why I said that um, it, it is not that many. But typically, no, people don't, don't, don't go for it. They use, uh, yeah, something with the 10 by 10 design. You can. Okay, another one. This is the favorite of statisticians because uh, when they have to deal with these other techniques, this method allows actually them to calculate analytically, bootstrap estimates. So there is this whole area, I mean, in statistics, I believe that they were developing it about, I would say, 30 years ago, in the mid-1980s. So there was an American, American statistician called Efron, so he did a lot of stuff with bootstrap. Uh, so how do you do this? Well, uh, typically, a bootstrap estimate is the following. So we uh, draw a sample with replacement. So what does it mean? So we sample an observation from, so we have this sample of n observations. And we sample with replacement. We decide what we're going to train on. So uh, we pick an observation randomly, right? And this is what we're going to use for training. But then when we repeat this, we again pick from the whole sample. So the observations are not removed from the sample, right? So when you do this, and you do it n times, you, do, you repeat it n times. So you sample n times from replacement, with replacement from the sample of n observations, okay? Uh, what, what is going to happen? Well, it is quite likely that certain observations will be sampled more than once, right? Because you are uh, sampling with, replace, with replacement, right? So they are going back. So in that case, since most uh, learning algorithms mm, do not actually allow duplicates, really, they consider it as the same thing, right? 
So the thing that you're going to learn on is going to be smaller than the, the original sum. How much smaller? Well, it is very easy to estimate what is the probability that we don't pick an instance, right? Because they're all things independent, right? So the probability that we don't pick uh, is 1 minus 1 over f, right? And each step is independent, so we repeat it n capital n times. So that's the probability. So for all this, it's independent, so it's 36.8% uh, will not be picked. Right? 36.8% will not be picked. OK, uh, so it means that we are going to learn from about uh, 63 right, percent of the sample. Okay? And this is one way to get a resampling estimate. Okay? So this is we get a sample, do the learning, estimate it on this thing. And uh, again, uh, there is variability. So when people do bootstrapping, and by the way, in machine learning, it is not really that popular, but we are, some people do it. They also repeat it a number of different times. Like with, when you repeat k-folding 10 times, so you, you can repeat bootstrap uh, several times. And then you average over those bootstrap estimates. Uh, this is very popular in statistics. Okay, statisticians love it because it's a more regular procedure that allows them to get some estimates. You know what? This is a very important topic. I have to give you a break, right? So why don't we have a 10 minute break now and we'll continue with this after the break. So we'll look, uh, take a detailed look at these performance models.